Welcome back to Outdoors with Larry Ray on ESPN 790 AM. Brought to you proudly by the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency. Hey, welcome back to Outdoors with Larry Ray. And, boy, we're already uh, an hour through the show. It's amazing. Fastest 90 minutes in outdoor radio program. And then uh, Frank Barton has set in on, uh, golly, I don't know. This is show number 494. Frank's probably been on 600 of them. I don't know, 500 at least. <laughs> Something like that, Frank, and uh, uh, appreciate Frank's friendship. We've been talking duck hunting, and we talk a little bit else, and uh, Frank's getting ready to head to the duck blind when we get through this morning, do a little teal hunting, a, a nice, cool morning. And I thought about, Frank, that, uh, you know, we've had this young man. I call him a young man. He thinks he's old, but I can remember, you know, when he was really young, I, I'm not sure he had hair then, but I don't know. But he's uh, <laughs> he learned from the masters himself, and uh, how important Frank is. Uh, how important is a gunsmith to uh, a man that likes to hunt, Frank? Oh my goodness! If you got, yeah, if if you don't know what you're doing, and, <laughs> uh, you know, I've, I've I have utilized a gunsmith on more than one occasion, and the best thing that I can say, most important thing I can tell people out there is. Uh, don't let an amateur yes work on your gun yes. like yourself yes yeah and uh yeah well i think so keith nothing, <laughs> now you can tell you know it, as keith will be able to tell you you know you can he can tell real quick when someone else has been working on it before he gets a hold of it yeah oh, oh yeah yeah and and keith warner thank you for being on those keith warner gunsmithing right there at the uh, care for shopping center at poplar and uh and kirby right in there and uh uh, before we get into the the technical side of this, Keith, tell our listeners a little bit how you got into this line of work. Yes, sir. Yes, well, thanks for having me this morning. Um, I got started uh, just with an interest in the historical aspect of firearms, and and also in hunting and and competitive shooting. I just every every aspect of firearms and what they were involved in intrigued me, and uh, I pursued that and uh, realized that I had did have a uh, potentially a knack for working on them and yes. shoot it with a gunsmith in school and, and a close friendship and acquaintance with uh, M.B. Highsmith and Ed Mason, who later employed me. Yes. <laughs> and uh, just kind of just really one thing led to another and uh, realized that I had a knack for it, built a business around it, and uh, now we're not just gunsmithing, but doing a retail gun business as well. And, yes. Uh, things are going well. And, Keith, I know that uh... – was this, when did you make this decision? How old were you when you said, I think I want to be a gunsmith? I was 20 years old when I decided that. I'm 45 now, uh, about to be 46 in November. Uh-huh. Um, I uh, was 20 years old, and I just decided I'm going to really just see what this is about, pursuing this as a career. And uh, Was there a school? Uh, did, did you go to school? Yes, sir. All right, you went to a, yes, a gunsmithing school, like uh... yes, sir. After after college, there uh, I pursued a. There's a technical degree. They actually have an associate's degree uh-huh. uh, in it, like a tech school. And uh, and there's a couple. There's a handful of schools, small handful of schools around the country that offer that associate's degree and uh, and and, a, and a, an extensive program. And I chose one of the best, and uh, and then really enjoyed that. Where was and that? Got a lot out of it. Where was that? Where, where was that? Uh, that was in Pine City, Minnesota. Pine City, Minnesota. Uh, okay. Yeah, it was absolutely 60 miles north of Minneapolis, St. Paul. And uh, if you blink, you'd miss it. And uh, <laughs> But I had a really good instructor, Bruce LePage, who was a great great gun maker and a great artist. And uh, I had seen some of his work, and I kind of wanted to do what he did and uh, followed him, much like I ended up following uh, in footsteps of High Smith and Mason here in Memphis. But you you grew up here, right? Are you from? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Born and raised in Memphis. Uh, went to high school uh, here. Yeah, went to grade school and uh, high school here, and uh, graduated from uh, NUS, and uh, and then went on to University of Tennessee and University of Montana, and then uh, <laughs> and then Gunsmith School. Uh, it's amazing, folks. Uh, how many gunsmiths are there in in the Shelby County area, would you estimate? Right now, I believe there are there are I think three of us that I know of full time. Now, some other shops offer some. some yeah, some on the side, like Frank was saying. Mm-hmm. You know, some mm-hmm. on the yeah, side. Yeah, but there, uh, 
And there's three of us that I know of for a fact that are that are full time and run primarily gunsmithing shops. Do you do you does that concern you as far as the future of gunsmithing, Keith? I mean, you're you're getting to be forty six, you say, and uh, yeah, uh, you know, I mean, somebody's got to pass this down. Like Ed Mason, I knew it. I know Ed. You knew Ed. I knew, of course, Mister Highsmith. Uh, yeah. Man, what a man he was, and uh, what a wife he had. You know, that's and, right. Uh, that's right. Uh, and and uh, as an opera singer, she's a uh, what? Willamina? What's her name? Willamina? Uh, Willina? Willina yeah, Highsmith. Yeah, wonderful lady. Ninety-four late. years. Ninety-four, 94 years old. Years old. And you, I saw her just yesterday. Yeah, you did. Well, well, yep. So talk about that. Does that? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that there's it's it's somewhat of a dying art, and uh, to a degree, I, uh-huh. I have seen a little bit of a resurgence in it. There are some younger folks, not necessarily that I know of in this area. Uh-huh. One of the guys that is full time here uh, in, the, in the Shelby County area is considerably younger uh, than me, maybe 10, uh, well, I'm actually probably about 15 years younger okay. than me. Okay, all right. And, uh-huh. um, and and he's doing all right. He's coming along. And, you know, the problem is there's such a there's such a long um, the long learning curve. To it this is. Business. And yeah. you got to have a knack for it, but you gotta you got to really put in the time, and, and that's a deterrent and, uh, and for a lot of folks. But there's some young ones coming along, but uh, so it's not a huge concern. Somewhat job security, so I like that part. Yeah, you do, you do have that, and I know uh, uh, the job that you do, the meticulous, because what you do, it's it's your you're putting your stamp. You're an artist. Do you consider yourself an artist? I mean, I do I, to some degree. It depends on the work I'm doing. Some days it's more mechanic than a, than an artist, but uh, still you have to kind of art. But there's an art to being a mechanic as well and understanding there is. the intricacies of it and uh, knowing how it works and how it can work better and and how to fix it if it's not working correctly. And this time of year, Frank, you know that. Uh, uh, are we too late to make sure that our, our firearms are ready for deer season, duck season? Uh, I mean, no, there's still there's still a little bit of time left. We always have a heavy workload, but I, you know, I've, I've said before, we try to prioritize. I, you know, somebody's trying to get ready. What season is coming next? And that's yes. who takes priority right now. Yeah, um, we do first come first serve as much as we can. But, but uh, at the same time, if I've got a long-term restoration project and I've got a bunch of duck guns and deer rifles stacked up yeah. and season's on their door, then the, the duck and deer rifles are certainly going to take precedence. What's a, what's And Frank listens in on this. What's the number one problem that somebody will bring in for, say, a uh, – uh, I got a Browning tw- uh, Gold, 12 gauge, uh-huh. Uh-huh. you know, I mean, a, 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 that I use for – duck season and you yeah. know you know where i got it i got it at, at, at that when i worked there you know yeah. uh, where we met and things right. like that. so what is the and, and frank listen up for this though so, so what is the number one problem that someone may bring the the, the shotgun they're going to use for duck hunting and what's what's the, the the number one problem that you might find that people bring in to try to correct I think a lot of it is you've got a gun that falls under general the general uh, title of it's it's jamming. And it's jamming, not be, yeah. It's, it's not, you there know, you jam. go, yeah. Hear it's that, Frank? Hear so that, Frank? <laughs> that can that could be a, 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 a plethora of different uh, uh, issues. Mm, plethora. And but, uh, oh, now hold on, now, Keith. Of, we don't use the words like plethora on here because that's, that's, that's one of those big words like mayonnaise. <laughs> <laughs> Frank, did you could you interpret plethora for us, Frank? That's right. That's right. That's right. That's a total course into itself. In yeah. Yeah. School. Um, no, but uh, they've got uh, they, the problem is is that there's a lot of maintenance involved in firearms. And yes, people provide general maintenance. So you know, people, well, I clean my gun, and that's good. They clean their gun, but a lot of times, and some of the, especially the semi-automatic shotguns, yes, yeah. there are certain intricacies and and peculiarities to the to the mechanism. That that really need to be uh, see the attention of a gunsmith, and so you know otherwise somebody an amateur getting into them or the, just the individual the owner getting into them can do more damage than good. I usually tell people it's a good idea to get your gun in in at least once a year to a gunsmith. Yeah. And if you're duck hunting heavy, twice a year is good. You know, before season and after season. And that's a good good way to make sure that all the little details are are in order and nothing is 
gone unattended and 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 gotten worse just from neglect. All right, Frank, you got a question for uh, for Keith? You know, I'm not not necessarily a question, but how often do you get what in in my power sports business we call them box jobs, and what that mm-hmm. is is you know the ones that the people have tried to work on themselves and then they <laughs> give it up and then they bring it into the professional to yeah. finish up. How often does that happen to you? Yeah, uh, we call that a bag bag o gun. A bag o gun. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. they kind of they bring it in a bag a bag of gun parts, and uh, we don't <laughs> get that a lot. Uh-huh. I mean, we we get that a little bit, and it's kind of enough to where it's kind of a little bit of a running joke. But no, it happens, and I tell people, I was like, heck, you know, there's one most gunsmiths got out there by getting into one and probably got in over their head at one time or another yes. themselves. But uh. And some of us didn't have the sense enough to go seek professional help to no. so pursue a career in gunsmithing. Too too embarrassed but, uh, or anything like that. That uh, so no, uh, but we we get that every once in a while, and uh, you know it's just sometimes it's not that big a deal. Sometimes it's a it's a you know a mountain to the customer and a molehill to us. So we just try to look at it and and uh, and we take those with a grain of salt. But we don't we don't get that a lot. But we we do. Every once in a while, maybe maybe to a degree, if I tried to take it apart and do the right thing and clean it, and I can't get the trigger assembly back in it, well, you know, we can we I've can. I've been take there, that done that. I've been there, there, done that. I think I took it to Keith. Then I don't know. I've been there, yeah. done. Hey, Keith, uh, how do they get in touch with you? Uh, where are you located? Uh, got a couple of minutes yeah. here. Tell us. Uh, tell my listeners out there, and uh, and we'll have sure. all this posted on lroutdoors.com uh, along with this uh, segment with Keith. So tell them how they get in touch with you and your store hours and things like that. Yeah. We're we're here Monday through Friday, ten to five, at, at the Care Four Shopping Center on the southwest corner of Poplar and Kirby. That's sixty six fifty five Poplar Avenue, Suite one hundred one. And that number Monday through Friday, ten to five. And our phone number is nine zero one seven three seven thirteen twenty. And you got a Facebook page? We got a Facebook page. Love for you to visit that. We try to uh, showcase really as much good. of our work as possible. Yes, yeah. check us out. Keith Warner Gunsmithing Inc. That's it. Thank you, Keith Warner. Appreciate you, buddy. We're going to try to uh-huh. stay with you once a month if we can, okay? All right, great. Y'all have a great Saturday. Thank All you right. Much. Thank you, Keith. All right, Bye-bye. Keith Warner. Good job, Frank. Uh, you know, uh, you get down to the last minute and you you see something doesn't work and you say, well, golly, it's almost like uh, ATV, right? I mean, people uh, wait till the last and then all of a sudden they're bringing them in oh, to sure. you. Uh, I, I'm sure that's happening now probably, right? Yeah, and, and you know, I started thinking about. I probably have more gunsmithing tools than the average person. Yeah, you do. Um, uh, because I, I, you know, I do, you know, I do tinker with it. Well, uh, you know, yeah, you tinker. But, but I also know the value of having the right tools. Yes. Yeah. And I and, and I don't. He, know, I think I I built three or four different ARs and got one that I have to. I'm trying to figure out what I'm how I'm going to build it right really? now. Really. Oh. Okay, that's a side uh, of you I haven't experienced but before. To me, that's a little that's a little bit different. To, to the 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 uh, the craftsman part of it is fascinating to me to watch the guys that do things with yeah you know the uh, you know the old doubles and side by side. I've got one. So, I've got an eighteen ninety eight uh, side uh, double barrel uh, shotgun that my uncle gave me and. Uh, I've taken it. I have taken it to Keith. I want Keith to look at it because another guy told me it was a wall banger. And he said, I said, what's that? And he said, well, just put it on the wall and go bang. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, about what it's worth. But all right. Take a break. Frank Barton in the house. Well, I wish he was in the house. He's in his house, I guess, or someplace. But anyway, it's me, Shelby McCall, in the studio. One segment to go. Let's head to the Little Red River. And we'll be right back to talk about it.